Our scripture today comes from the book of First Chronicles, and I only listed the one verse where our hidden figure, Shira is mentioned, but I realized you might need a little more context, so I'm going to give you a few extra verses. The sons of Ephraim, Shulathea and Bered his son, Tahath his son, Eladah his son, Tahath his son, Zabad his son, Shulatheha his son, and Azar and Eliad. Now the people of Gath, who were born in the land, killed them because they came down to raid their cattle. And their father Ephraim mourned many days, and his brothers came to comfort him. Ephraim went into his wife, and she conceived and bore another son, and he named him Beriah, because disaster had befallen his house. His daughter was Shira, who built both lower and upper Beth Horon and Uzen Shira. Repha was his son, Reshpa his son, Tela his son, Tahan his son, Laden his son, Amihud his son, Elishama his son, Nun his son, Joshua his son. Their possessions and settlements were Bethel and its towns, and eastward Naaran, and westward Gazar and its towns, Shechem and its towns, as far as Aya and its towns. When Pastor Jacob and I were planning this sermon series, I told him I wanted to preach a sermon about Shira. And he looked at this verse and he said, well, what are you going to say about her? It's just one sentence. And I said, excuse me, that one sentence tells us that this woman built multiple cities. And he said, okay, yeah, that's a good point. That'll preach. What's more, the reason I wanted to read the scripture surrounding this verse is to understand the context of her building. So Shira was the granddaughter of Ephraim, who was the son of Joseph, as in the coat of many colors, Joseph. And he was the son of Jacob and his favorite wife, Rachel. And Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham and his wife, Sarah, so Shira is part of this big, storied, complicated family with complex sibling relationships and husbands with multiple wives and female slaves who have been used to bring children into this family and strained parent-child relationships. If you recall the, the binding of Isaac where he's almost killed by his father. And not to mention all of the complicated expectations that everyone has regarding inheritance and faithfulness in this family. And you thought your Thanksgiving dinners could be a little awkward. And then we're told that Shira's grandfather, Ephraim, had three sons. And one of those sons had six sons. And all nine of them died while trying to raid their neighbor's cattle herd. Did you know that the Bible had a store, a tragic story about cattle raiders? Well, now you know. But this is why Shira's accomplishments are all the more amazing. Her grandfather and her grandmother conceived her father during a period of mourning in their lives, a time when they thought everything was lost. Nine sons and grandsons here one day and gone the next. Can you imagine the heartbreak? and the grief and the despair of this family in that time. And yet, somehow life was created again and again and again, and the lineage carried on for generations and generations. Now, I don't know what stories Shira was told growing up. I don't know if her parents explained to her the significance of how she was born to a man who was only conceived after all three of his brothers and all of their sons died in a senseless, violent clash with the neighbors. I don't know which details they shared with Shira and which details they glossed over in an attempt to spare her some sadness. But her name, Shira, means consanguity, kinswoman, descendant. So I have a feeling they told her a lot maybe even everything. I bet Shira knew that her existence was an unlikely gift from God to this family of tension and grace and conflict. And I bet she internalized this sense of being a gift 
into her daily activities as a child. I like to imagine her father telling her his family lore as she plays with her toys as a child. And I like to imagine that she begins stacking little rocks as she listens to these stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the next time he tells her these stories, she starts stacking bigger stones on top of each other and thinking about Abraham and Rachel and Rebecca and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And the next time, she starts stacking little twigs and she starts testing the best way to stack them to make sure that they're sturdy and they won't fall. And as she grows older, she begins scratching designs with one of those sticks into the dirt as her father talks, drawing walls and roads and houses as she thinks about Abraham and Isaac and Joseph and Jacob and Rachel. And then one day, as her father is telling her about his birth and about her birth, she begins building. She thinks about her grandfather's losses and she thinks about her great-grandfather Joseph's conflict with his brothers over that coat of many colors. And she starts stacking bricks. And she starts slathering them with mortar. And she thinks about how her great-grandfather Joseph escaped slavery and built a whole new life for himself before being reunited with his family. And she starts hauling stones from the river. And she starts making a wall. And then she starts tying sticks together, and she starts standing them upright as she thinks about her great-great-grandfather Jacob and how he wrestled with God. And then she starts building stairs and curving walls and arching ceilings. And at the end of the day, every day, she sits down and she watches the sunset over her handiwork, and she thinks to herself, I am a builder. In the midst of destruction, I am a builder. In a long line of conflict and wrestling with God and violence and death, I am a builder. I hear these stories of our beloved youth of this church, and I hear the promise of the future in their stories and in their voices. And I hope each of you youth know that you are builders. You are builders of big things that are made brick by brick, stone by stone, stick by stick, even in the midst of a world that I hear you understand can be a compassionless, broken, unkind place. You are builders even in the midst of scary headlines and systemic issues and problems that you will inherit as adults. You are part of this faith family and your job is to hear these stories and find hope in them, to see possibility through the fractures, and to see a future city where now there is only dust. As you each pointed out in your testimonies, significant things are built with many meaningful small steps. Every time you do something small and kind, you are building something. Every time you sit with your feelings instead of trying to run from them or numb them, you are building something small but significant. Every time you invite that lonely kid to hang out with you, the one who everyone else avoids because they're different in some way, you are building something small but significant. Every time you shrug off criticism or speak out against bullying or offer a kind word to someone, you are building something small but significant. And to my tall friends, to whom youth may seem a long ago adventure, I remind you that building is a lifelong endeavor. Every time you sit with a friend who is too consumed with their own problems to ever ask how you are doing, you are building something small but significant. Every time you have lunch with the coworker that everyone else is avoiding because they're not perceived as pulling their weight, you are building something small but significant. Every time you work on your anger issues or sit with someone who is terminally ill or show up for people that need you, every time you volunteer your time 
knowing that no one's going to pat you on the back and no one's going to give you an award for it. You are building something small but significant. Shira was just one daughter in an enormous and tangled family tree in the Bible. But she is remembered in this one very important line of scripture because she built cities, brick by brick, stone by stone, stick by stick. We are called to be spiritual builders, church. And when you come to worship here each week, I like to think of it as collectively consulting our spiritual blueprints, envisioning what could be built where currently there is only dust. So I hope that you have glimpsed something hopeful today in your mind's eye, something small but tangible, an act of faith that is being placed on your heart to go out and do in the world when you leave today. We are not responsible for fixing the whole world. We're not responsible for solving every single problem. But we are called to build good things with our lives, brick by brick, stone by stone, stick by stick. Amen.